All right, so I'm going to talk about, you know, the making of hackers, superheroes of the digital age. Uh, this is a passion project I've been working on for the past six months. A little bit about me. I mean, this is what they call the shameless self-promotion slides at conferences. Uh, I've been doing cybersecurity for longer than I'd like to admit. I think this is the 22nd year uh, of me doing this. Started off electronics communication, you know, did something in cybersecurity, uh, wrote a lot of the Catalyst 6500 code at Cisco back in 2004. And very soon I figured, hey, you know what, I didn't want to build Defender products, I actually wanted to break security. And this was the time when, you know, wireless security was becoming more and more interesting. So I found a bunch of wireless security attacks, Cafe Latte broke web cloaking, a bunch of others. Uh, spoke at DEF CON way back in 2007 and the first time I spoke there I just fell in love with just doing this you know literally as a career. Uh, so I went back you know told my parents hey, you know what I'm just going to quit and just do security research and build all of this and just go speak at conferences. Uh, surprisingly they were quite supportive so they said okay you know do do what you think you know you're kind of meant to do and, and that's how the whole journey began. Uh, so over the years, done a bunch of hacker conferences, a uh, lot of attacks, you know, one couple of competitions. So right now I'm the Microsoft Regional Director for the whole of APAC. It's an honorary position, I don't really work for them, uh, for cybersecurity. Spoken, trained, I think 25 plus countries over the last uh, 15 years, I guess. Uh, what most people probably kind of know me for is Pentester Academy. Uh, so I was the founder of Pentester Academy, started it way back in 2015, uh, ran it for many years. We, we grew it where we started having customers from over 150 countries, thousands of, uh, you know, users, enterprises all over the world. And in 2022 was when Pentester Academy was acquired by INE. Uh, you can clearly see who's the tech guy in that image. And you know, since then, of course, I've been looking at other interesting things that I wanted to do. So 22 years, right, of uh, being in cybersecurity, I've been seeing hacking as it's been shown in movies, books, media, and all of that. And how many of us have been approached by a friend who's like, hey, can you just recover my Facebook password? Or do you think you can hack into you know, my girlfriend's account or boyfriend's account, you know, I feel something's going on or whatnot, right? So I've gone through all of that over the years, uh, and there was only so much of, you know, pain that I could take. So if you look at mainstream media's characterization of hackers and cybersecurity overall, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of negative portrayal, right? Uh, at the very same time, a lot of stereotypes Right? Typically in a movie, you know, hacker is a guy who's just glued to a computer screen. That's all he knows. Uh, there's no other, you know, kind of interpretation of what a hacker could be, why he would do what he would do and all of that, right? Uh, and being old enough where I've kind of read the Hacker Manifesto, some of you may have read in FRAC uh, and all of that back in the day, you, you start feeling irritated. Uh, of course, not to mention all the unreal hacking scenes if you remember Swatfish <laughs> and, and a bunch of other movies, right? Now for me, the, the kind of most painful moment was, you know, when my own son started researching about what dad does and he started Googling me and he said, oh, I, I see somewhere it's written that, you know, you're a hacker, you know, so do you do bad things? You know, are you stealing from people? And, and he's nine. And, you know, I didn't want to wait for my younger son to catch up to that and think that, you know, dad is a criminal. So anyway, it was very interesting. I was looking at all of this and I said, hey, uh, is there something that I can do? You know, I love this industry. I've been doing this for such a long time. Uh, what is it that I can think about which could probably portray hackers a little differently? So that's really where I came up with a vision and said, you know what, why don't we create, and I'm just going to read this verbatim, uh, a hyper-realistic hacker comic that accurately, you know, depicts and demystifies the art and science of hacking, right? The reason I have this emphasis on the word hyper-realistic is I absolutely did not want anything imaginative in there, right? All the hacks down to the last detail need to be very real. If someone's reading it, 
you don't know a couple of terms, you could literally go Google and see that, oh, you know what, this actually is a real hack. This actually is a real attack. Uh, at the very same time, hopefully, you know, inspiring and educating people across an entire spectrum of cybersecurity knowledge, right? Because, uh, you know, I've been teaching and training so many years now, a lot of times when you meet people and you want to explain to them, especially those who aren't from cybersecurity, uh, I really wanted literally to be able to hand over a couple of these comics and say, hey, you know, why don't you read about this? There's interesting IoT hacks happening here, and maybe you might just be interested and learn more. So that was the vision. The additional thing I definitely wanted to do uh, was be extremely inclusive, right? The mainstream depiction of hackers, again, is very stereotypical, and that's really where I wanted hackers from different regions, races, age groups, socioeconomic conditions, uh, both men, women, teenagers, everything, right? And that was very important to me. I mean, having traveled the world, you know, so many countries, uh, I kind of felt like there was a disparity in the way hackers were looked at, uh, certain groups were overrepresented and all of that. So I think that's something I've tried to do in this series. Uh, you know, all across the series, we've tried to take different hackers as we go along different issues, different parts of the world and, and all of that. Of course, this was the vision. Uh, from here to a comic was an extremely long and painful journey. So I'm a tech guy and most of the time I actually spend on the console writing programs and scripts. I've literally not even written a UI in my whole life. And a, and a comic book is like the pinnacle of, you know, visual representation and interpretation, right? Uh, so when I was talking about this, you know, told some folks, they were like, oh, are you serious? And I was like, I'm very serious. And that's really when I said, okay, you know what? Let's start researching about it. The rest of the talk is really, you know, what I did, what I was researching, how, how I got the team together, future plans and all of that. So the first thing, of course, you know, any of us would end up doing is pretty much buying every book you can. Of course, you unfortunately don't read most of them, but makes you feel good <laughs> that at least you have the books in hand. So went on Amazon, started searching for every best rated book on you know, making comics, writing comics, illustrations. Uh, Somehow I had the guts to even, you know, pick up an iPad and try to see if I did have an artistic, you know, bent of mind. Definitely didn't, didn't go beyond the ball and stick models. Uh, and that's really where, you know, after going through this, I had some idea about what was the whole process. Because the minute I wanted to talk to artists and writers and all of that eventually, I at least wanted to have the same jargons that they were using, right? so that I could connect to them, talk to them, you know, they could understand what the vision was and all of that. So after this, I spent a humongous number of hours just gorging on videos or documentaries uh, about different comic books, industries, and, and whatnot. Uh, and really, my Netflix time completely changed to just this. Uh, and, and folks who know me, once I get into something, I'm crazy obsessed. So this is literally all I was doing most of the time. Hours and hours and hours, right? And that's really where I think the, the key moment of kind of inspiration on how to do this uh, came from a video in which Stan Lee, who most of you may be aware, uh, is kind of godfather of the whole Marvel Universe, created you know, most of the superheroes uh, that you see Iron Man, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So he had this very interesting uh, thing that he mentioned when someone asked him, hey, you know, how do you write? What inspires you? And all of that. And he said, hey, write for yourself, right? Write what you would want to read. And, and I think that simplified things because in the very beginning when I was thinking of doing this, I started having so many different reader groups in mind, right? Reader groups across the different world. And, and I'm not a writer. Right, not a professional writer at all. Uh, written a lot of tech documentation and maybe a couple of essays when I had to in school. Like that, that's it. That's the most amount of writing I ever did. So I said, okay, this simplifies. Why don't I write something where I feel satisfied and I feel that I've done justice to the hacks, to the hacking, to the hackers and all of that, right? So that's really where I kind of begun the journey. Uh, started 
thinking about storyboarding, you know, how do you introduce characters and all of that, and, and really completely absorbed myself into it. Came out, after all of that, with this awful looking draft. <laughs> on a bunch of papers where I said, okay, you know what, this is how the story is going to move, here are the characters, this is what we want to do, uh, this is probably how you know, we are going to introduce each one of them, maybe this would lead to a series and whatnot. So this was the very first draft and when I looked at it, I said, hey, I need to set a deadline for myself, right? Because most passion projects end up dying because you don't set a deadline. You start something and then you just forget about it along the way. And then you start giving it lesser and lesser time and eventually it just, it's just out of your mind altogether. So I said, okay, the best thing to probably do is put myself on a world stage at Comic Con and just get a booth over there and just say, hey, you know, I have to launch the entire comic series at Comic Con Singapore. And this was before I had hired anyone. I had even like decided what would be there in the series and whatnot, right? So I think the date was uh, May 25th. I sent a mail to Comic Con and I said, hey, how much, how much do I have to pay to get a booth? They responded, got an early spot on the booth and I said, okay, let's go with this. So then I went back to my team and I started telling them, hey, you know what? Now we need to begin hiring. I have to hire folks who can draw. Uh, and then we went through a bunch of interviews. So the very first thing I tried is I tried to get freelancers online and that didn't work. It's simply because uh, unlike a piece of graphic art, comic books are sequential art and there's a lot of things one has to be coherent about, right? How the characters are drawn, how things flow. And I quickly figured that if you just hired somebody external to do it on the side, it probably isn't going to work out well. So then I said, you know what, if I'm really serious about doing this as a bunch of issues or, or probably as long as I can, why not just get a full-time team? And that's really where we started hiring a full-time team. So we were lucky, you know, I managed to hire Quan, John, Weiming is, is right there. I forced him to take some pictures. Uh, and you know, these guys are great artists, fantastic work. And that's really how we kind of started off. So the very first thing we began with was character design. Uh, that's really where I kind of sat down with the artist and I said, okay, this is exactly how I'm visualizing issue one. These are the different characters. You can think about drawing them, portraying them. Uh, and this took quite a bit of time, right? Because when you look at a character, you always feel like, oh, maybe you could change this or you could change that. Finally, I had to decide and say, you know what, let's settle somewhere in between and say, this is good enough for the character and let's kind of like just move on. So character design is the very first phase of any comic book creation. Uh, the important thing here is you want to make sure that you at least flesh out all the important characters in the comic, the different perspectives in which you probably want to show them angry, sad, uh, you know, probably sitting in front of a computer, whatnot. And, and those are things which the artist can do and actually give you various options. So this is the final zeroed down set of characters. From there is where kind of the really long process begins, where you go ahead, create thumbnails for each of the pages. And this is a very iterative process. Uh, so I storyboarded you know, the very first issue entirely where I sat down and I said, okay, if I had to fill 30 pages, let's break the pages up and let's try to decide what sequentially I need to put in every page. The reason it's iterative is the moment you go to page 10, you suddenly feel, you know what, like page eight and nine, I think I overdid one part. Then you go back once again, you fix that. Uh, and this took a bit, bit of time. I think I probably spent you know, 10, 12 hours a day at the very minimum uh, for a week, week and a half straight just to make sure it was like perfect the way at least I wanted it. Now, once the storyboarding happens, the very next step is when the artists kick in and they kind of come in and they start sketching. 
right? These are very rough early sketches. Uh, today's world, everything is digital. I mean, few people still do it, you know, paper and pen and ink, but most of it is just pure digital art. And that's when they start sketching, you know, I sit with the artists, give them feedback. I say, oh, you know what, this looks good. No, 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 I, I need to see the access point because the attack is a wireless attack. You probably haven't shown the access point properly. Uh, let's bring that in focus and whatnot, right? Uh, so the very first phase, sketching, that's really where you can go back, change, make changes even to the storyboarding and whatnot. From that point on, you really cannot change much. It's just kind of going forward where you start inking it. Inking is really now, I mean, layman's term is shading, making sure that, you know, this is exactly how you want the characters to look like uh, and all of that. It's a pretty intense process. I mean, one of the one of the big things that I've learned is how difficult it is for artists to create beautiful work. Like my appreciation for the art world and people making art has kind of gone like tenfold up since I went through the process with them. Uh, after the inking, you basically have coloring, which is kind of expected. Uh, this is interesting as well, right? Because how you color a comic kind of decides overall the tone of you know the whole narrative and so many other things. And this was also something we, we kind of iterated over a bunch of times and said, okay, do we want to do it this way, that way? Uh, maybe some of the pages need to be, you know, as you can see, the last page in the comic kind of looks a bit fuzzy, the main character, because that's really where we're kind of trying to hide the identity of the character, but at the very same time trying to tell you like, hey, you know, he, He's the protagonist in uh, all of this. So all of this happened. Then I had to sit down and write dialogues. And that was an extremely interesting process. Uh, because it's if you haven't done it, it's very, very difficult in the beginning to decide how you want to narrate the story from the perspective of different characters. And I think I really enjoyed the experience. Sat down, wrote the dialogues. Uh, you know, my, my entire family had to read the different dialogues probably 10 times over. They were all fed up. There's like printouts of the comic all over the home. Uh, had everybody read and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And kept revising. So once the dialogues and everything happened, we put the comic together. And that's really when we thought, okay, now's the time to print it. I haven't ever printed anything, right? Ever gotten printing anything. And then we said, okay, let's figure out how much it actually costs to get this done. And first I said, you know, well, we've done everything in Singapore, all the artists, everybody's right here. It is kind of created completely here. Let's also print it here. And then we got some quotes, which were just impossible. So each comic, literally, we would have printed at 25 to $30. And we were like, hey, there's no way that we can do this kind of printing. So then, you know, Joseph on our team, you know, he contacted a lot of uh, printers based out of China. And then we started the process of talking to them, figuring out like, hey, you know, how does this all work? You know, what is the MOQ? Hundreds of other terms. And then finally we zeroed down on a printer who we liked uh, based upon the copies that he created. And then finally it went for printing. So this was a very surreal moment where the printer, you know, showed us a very simple video of the entire printing process. I'm gonna play that. And it's almost like, for me, it was like a tearful kind of joy moment, uh, and for the rest of the team, because you were like, hey, finally this is going into print. Uh, I ordered 2,000 copies, because you we were doing a booth at Comic Con, so I was thinking maybe I'll give out like 1,000 copies there. And then I wanted to reserve more for other conferences, you know, SyncCon, you know, maybe even ship some to European conferences and US conferences later. Uh, and this was the whole process of them finally packing it, packaging it, I didn't know I had to register for customs. <laughs> so, so literally a week before uh, you know, Comic Con was going to happen, the packages arrived, but all of them were stuck at customs. So, so then we went ahead, created the you know, uh, customs account, and thankfully it kind of you know, got released the very next day. So yeah, so this was, this was a very great moment for all of us. Uh, the books finally arrived at the office. I'm going to wait for...
And this is like 2,000 copies, right? We, we sat in the office, opened up all the boxes, frantically had to make sure that all the pages were printed right, they were in the right order, right? Anything is messed up, I'm like, I'm dead. Uh, Everybody on the team was overjoyed. As you can see, you know, Sara from her team kind of wore sunglasses so she could look like a hacker. And uh, after this, we said, hey, let's, let's get ready for Comic Con. So this, the whole printing, everything happened and all the books reached literally four days before Comic Con with the whole custom release and all of that. Uh, so then we set up the entire booth at Comic Con. So this is the larger team. You can see Justine here on the left. She's right here. And a bunch of guys. That's the Ghostbusters character. If any of you have seen Ghostbusters. So this was a great moment where we felt like, hey, we kind of put together a project within five to six months. You know, we didn't know anything about comic book building, printing, none of that. Learned a lot of that along the way, put everything together. We also had many superheroes visit us as well as super villains at Comic Con. Uh, this is just two weeks back in December. We even had Santa Claus come in. You know, Santa wanted to learn how to stop APT attacks by the Grinch. You know, who'd know? <laughs> So I had Santa read through a couple of pages, and I said, hey, maybe you guys need some security in the North Pole, right? You're shipping so many packages. <laughs> Supply chain security, yeah. <laughs> so I think post Comic Con, uh, it was a very satisfying moment, because I said like six months, a lot of hard work, and then I decided, hey, you know, now let's actually release the comic worldwide. And that's really when we set up the website, uh, vrncomics.com. And so the plan for me all, all along was, I mean, this was a passion project, right? I was not really planning to charge anything for the comic books themselves. So the e-edition of this comic and everything else, we just wanted to give it away for people to read, you know, because the idea really was to right a wrong, right? The mainstream characterization of how hackers are looked at and whatnot. So we said, hey, if you, if you just want an e-copy, you could just go to the website and, and get one. Uh, within 24 hours, it completely blew up. Uh, we have thousands of downloads, you know, hundreds of comments within the first 24 hours of launching it across the world. Uh, I think right now the downloads are, are, are pretty high. I haven't checked the last time, but probably tens of thousands. And, and that was very positive. I really felt like, oh, you know what? We did something which people are finding, you know, kind of worthwhile to comment about, right? It's a very high bar for someone on uh, LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter to sit down, write a review, write something about it. Uh, so very, very satisfying moment for the whole team. So of course, the uh, question is, you know, what next? And that's really where what most of you have right now is issue one. And we worked during those six months to ensure we already pre-create the future issues as well. So actually, issue number two uh, is already done, and so is three and four as well. So these are, of course, uh, you know, test print copies where you're still looking at the dialogues and a, and a bunch of other last-minute things. Uh, but the vision, as I said, is to kind of keep this on, probably run it as long you know, as I can, which hopefully is going to be like another 10 years, 15 years, uh, just like I did Pentester Academy or, or previous projects. And the idea is to come out with a monthly issue. Uh, and the way the issues talk about the hacks and attacks is I've tried to make it very current. So the first one that you have when you get time to read, you know, it talks about a mix of, you know, IoT security, smart TV, Wi-Fi, and a couple of other things. Uh, the second one is interesting. It has a bit of AI security in it. Uh, it talks about gaming and, you know, how probably some game companies could end up creating biases and how to figure those things out and things like that. The third one is interesting. It's actually a ransomware attack on a hospital, uh, 
where you know what happens and what does the hero do you know based upon uh, you know his wife being admitted there and all of that so what i've tried to do is mix a very interesting storytelling with very technical details of actually how the hack happens and what's going on and all of that right uh, of course i i cannot make it a lab manual so when you look at the hacks and everything you will see there is a good amount of detail but not detail where you could just look at that and start typing commands on a console right uh, then it's going to be boring and really the idea was that hey if you don't know about this topic at all you should be able to pick it up enjoy the story like you know what the hacks look like and then go out there and maybe like research uh, the fourth one is interesting it's actually a prison break uh, in the fourth one what we really have is someone figuring out how the entire like prison software system worked and all of that because most of those are pretty antiquated uh and what's happening you know and how he does something and what not so all interesting stories along with that we are releasing swag stickers we gave away a lot of stickers here at syncon uh t-shirts might be available on the website for people who like it you know they could just purchase now when i was thinking about this project i was like okay what else can we actually do around this uh and when you look at superheroes and all of that at that point i know many of you must have bought like action figures right iron man uh spider man you know what not and that's really where i asked myself hey why aren't there any tech action figures well i can't call them action figures really lack of a better word i'll i'll still stick to that then i was like hey isn't tech cool like why can't we have like a nice little action figure you know of a hacker sitting on a computer just hacking away right uh or probably someone who's looking at hardware security like looking at a you know big circuit board and maybe looking at some jtac connectors on it uh and make these around like 3 or 4 inches where it's nice to kind of keep on your table so you're a malware analyst and it is maybe themed around malware and and what not uh So when I told my team this is the next thing they were like you gone crazy you clearly gone crazy <laughs> So that's something we are now working on <laughs> So what we are trying to do is see if we could create like extremely detailed uh diagrams and convert these into vinyl toys and there are various uh various ways to kind of do it and hopefully in the next 3 months we should actually launch it uh as of today we are actually talking to a uh, couple of you know guys based out of china who are already doing it for the marvel toys and many others and see if we can do this so the idea really is i mean this is of course a base hacker version uh you have you know a male as well as a female version but after this how do you customize this for let's say somebody who's doing malware analysis how do you create something where you know someone who's doing hardware hacking ot security what not so hopefully you could have like different versions based upon what you like what you specialize i think this is an amazing experience and uh, pretty grateful that i got to share with all of you for all the future issues which you're going to release jan onwards you can just visit vrn comics you know just add your email in there and you'll automatically get an intimation when the next issue is available as i said all the issues as they are released every month you can just read completely for free online uh there's there's no real charges there's nothing so there's no hidden costs right it's it won't be that you open the pdf and five pages later there's like enter your credit card right <laughs> uh so all right cool so i think thank you very much uh hopefully you enjoy the comic if you like it you know you can message me on linkedin twitter uh, drop me an email would love to know your feedback and later on if any one of you want to uh, you know have the comic signed by me more than happy yeah to do that as well thank you so much